Hey guys, Professor Bill, Comic Book University, and this spotlight on story is going to be about Call the Conqueror. Now, this is the Marvel Comics version of Call the Conqueror. This was a fantastic comic book. Uh, it's not even just a single comic book. They made uh, Marvel graphic novels about this. Really cool ones there. That will probably be a spotlight on story at some point, too. In the meantime, right here, we're just going to talk about the first six or so issues of the Marvel comic called The Conqueror. This is, of course, a character that was created by Robert E. Howard. Now, it's important to understand that Weird Tales was the the book where this first came out. It's actually a, a, an anthology of pulp fiction stories that used to come out. In fact, even before Robert E. Howard was writing stories in here, a certain guy named H.P. Lovecraft was writing his stories in here. That's right. The Call of Cthulhu and all those amazing stories over there, Shadow Over Innsmouth, all this, they appeared here in Weird Tales. Uh, this Cthulian mythos that was created by Howard, uh, excuse me, by uh, Lovecraft, uh, Robert E. Howard actually saw some of these, read some of these, and was like, this is really cool. You know what? I would actually like to make stories in this world also, but way in the past, in the Hyborian Age, and that's when he created the Conan character. Those stories first appeared here also. I believe Solomon Kane appeared here also, which was actually the first set of stories that he'd gotten published, but eh, uh, Cull eventually showed up also. So uh, the first Cull story was actually called The Shadow Kingdom, and that was in Weird Tales, August of 1929. Um, yeah, there was also a 1997 movie featuring Kevin Sorbo, and may I make the strong recommendation to not see that movie. That was a terrible, should I say it's a terrible movie? Let's just say it was a Kevin Sorbo movie. <laughs> Let's just leave it at that. Let's just leave it at that. Okay. So, Call the Conqueror. <laughs> it's a freaking amazing story. So, to get the setting, the entirety of the Marvel Universe is actually based on <clears throat> the Hyborian and pre-cataclysmic eras. So all of these actually fall into Marvel Comics in and of themselves. Before, so we don't really have a God story, so to speak, and Jesus and all that. We don't really have that in the Marvel Universe. Go to DC for that. In Marvel, what happened was that there was this place, Thuria, and Atlantis was above the sea, and there was the most highly technologically advanced people, and the tallest, strongest people that you could possibly imagine. Atlantis was essentially perfect. Maybe had some moral complications, but hey, they like to torture people for any little crime. But nonetheless, they um, they were these were the people, and Cull was one of the exiled Atlanteans. Uh, at first, he was raised, you know, someplace else, and you could read all that stuff. Go and go and read up on Cull. Read these stories, in fact, and they'll tell you those. Uh, they'll tell you all about them. Or maybe consider checking out a 10 Things About Cull, explained in a minute on Comic Book University. You never know. You never know. Either way, we've got this character who was raised by tigers, <laughs> not wolves, tigers. And uh, in fact, he's the first character called the Tiger King. Oh, hey, and didn't have a blonde bullet either. So he, um, he existed in, in in the the city of wonders and uh, basically he became, he became the king of the city of wonders and that is actually explained in this first issue so to get into that uh cull is basically they, they they go through his story they, they start off with him actually entering the city and having a parade he's already the king he's already the champion of the people and whatnot but there's some dissent and the people are actually, you know, some of them saying, yeah, you're awesome. And some of them saying, no, you suck. And we got to get rid of this guy. This is very much straight out of the original Cull story. The only difference that I noticed is that the trumpets were actually last in the original story. But here, Roy Thomas writing this story, uh, the trumpets are first, which I found interesting. Aside from that, there's almost no difference. There, there's such minor, minuscule differences in the air, even less than where the trumpets were in the parade. <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, the all these guys are going on, and we, we get the first introduction to Electo, who is the, the head of the Red Slayers. That's the personal guard of the, um, of, of the king. And he's got all these other people. Redondo is the bard. Uh, the Baron Kanub is the, these are the two people who are most trying to get rid of Kull. Uh, Baron Kanub actually has some royal bloodline, but he's just some, 
I don't know. He's really out of shape. He's short. He's not particularly good looking. He's got nothing. He's not a warrior. He's got absolutely nothing going for him. He's almost the exact opposite of Cull. And what's funny about this guy, uh, Baron Kanub, is he sees all the crazy things that are happening in the kingdom. He sees how hard it is to be the king. He sees that freaking the City of Wonders would fall to the ground. Uh, Thelusia, all of it. It would all just fall to the ground if it wasn't for uh, Valencia, the, 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 the country itself, and then Valencia, the continent. Um, mind you, this is pre-cataclysm. Uh, all of it would just fall to the ground if it wasn't for Cull specifically. And yet, Kanub is just like, I want to be king. I want to de depose uh, Cull, and I want to be the king. Dude, you would die, and everything would fall apart. But you feel like there's some bloodline there. Anyway, um, all of this is Cull. Uh, the, the backstory here is that Cull has actually come to this city after being exiled from the uh, from Atlantis because of well, go and check out all that good stuff, including the 10 things about. And he is settled here, and he became one of the Black Legion. Uh, in fact, he wound up heading up his own uh, division of these specialist warriors who would go out and fight on behalf of the king. And Canub, Redondo, all these guys, they conspire, they've been conspiring to get rid of the king so that Canub can actually be, in, uh, could be the new king. And they're like, we can use Cull, because he's stupid. Eh. Kind of. He is kind of dumb, especially in this regard. Like, oh, hey, you know, you uh, you know that the king is planning on getting rid of your legion. He's like, what? How dare he? I'm going to go and confront him right now. So he goes up. He's like, king, I should kick your butt. And it's like, oh, of course it's you. Who else could knock my doors right off of the freaking hinges? You know, see my iron doors right off the hinges. And it's like, how dare you get rid of my, my legion? He's like, actually, I wasn't planning on getting your, rid of your legion. But now that you mentioned something... Well, now the thought's in my head, and maybe I just might do that. If the king was wise, he'd have said, first off, whoever told you this is a liar. Why would I get rid of my most powerful legion? But the king wasn't wise. The king thought that he had to try and prove himself to be a tough guy. Well, he is a tough guy. In fact, the only scar that Cull actually keeps on his body forever is the, the scar that he gets from battling the king, because he does decide to battle the king. And the king winds up leaving a big uh, gash across his right eye. So he can still see through and everything, but there's just this huge scar that will never heal off of Cull. That is one of the identifying marks of who the character is. So just boom, that happens. But he does wind up killing the king. And Kanub and everybody's like, yeah, he got rid of him. So now I can take the crown because I'm royal bloodline. And Cull is just like, actually, and just like on the front cover... Uh, this happens in the book also. He puts his sword through the crown and picks it up, and he's like, actually, you didn't do anything. I did everything. This is going to be a very strong... I'm going to get into the philosophy of this character towards the end of this video, because the philosophy of the character and Robert E. Howard's philosophy was just it, absolutely amazing to me. Amazing. There's some bad parts to it. There's some bad parts to these stories. But all that being said... This was really genuinely amazing, and I love this, but pay attention to some of the defining aspects of who Cull is. So, Cull says, I actually did all of this work. I did this. I deposed the king. I deserve to be the king. Sorry, who are you again? And he's like, uh, 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 well, uh, all hail the king. The king is dead. All hail the king. Because he knows better. Cull now becomes the king. He takes the crown. And he is now the king. That is how he becomes the king of Volusia, the city of wonders. So he decides, you know, we got to keep the army sharp. So that means having some parades. When we don't actually have fights, we have to have some parades. They have to do, you know, training, whatever, but blah, 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 whatever. We have to keep the people understanding what's going on. Also, he does hear, as we saw in the beginning of this, he does hear people saying good things about him. He doesn't reward them. He hears people saying bad things about him. Not only does he not punish them, but when Electo, the king of the, 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 the head, I should say, of the Red Slayer, the captain of the Red Slayers, which is, again, the king's personal bodyguards, when he says, oh, Redondo the Bard, he's singing bad songs about you. He's trying to stir the people up to rile against you. It's like freedom of speech. It's not what he says, but it's basically the meaning. You can't just go and try and quash 
every single you know bit of words you know and, and this is true if you take away like these are poor people who don't have any real power and if you take away their words you know which is a form of uh dissent what form of dissent do you leave left except pitchforks and torches right so uh possibly a very wise thing for him to do now all this being said at some point uh Brul, the spear slayer this is a pictish warrior who comes up now, later on in the Conan stories, the Picts would be described as very dark-skinned and they're very savage, you can't trust them, they're dangerous and whatnot. Uh, in both the story uh, itself, the original story and this one, we, we have that the Picts are actually supposed to be representatives of the Native Americans. When the Pictish, when the cataclysm happens and everything starts being spread apart, especially, you know, after the Hyborian Age and whatnot, when everything starts being spread apart, the Native Americans are actually the Picts. The, that part gets moved over here to this, you know, continent. So that's the, well, these two continents. These are actually the Native Americans. Um, so while they're a little bit, while they're very savage and untrustworthy in Conan, pre-Cataclysm, they're very upright and stoic and truthful. And everybody knows, for the most part, that you can trust a Pict's word. Um, this picked Brule, uh, Brule the Spear Slayer, he comes up and he's like, hey, you know, uh, my king, uh, Kanu, uh, my, my chieftain, he wants to talk to you, but you have to come alone. He's like, alone? Why should I, how do I know that you actually, or, or that you actually are a representative of Kanu? And he's like, because I've spoken. So the king decides to rile him up, you know, a little bit more. He, the whole purpose is he's trying to rile him up. And he's like, really? That's interesting. <laughs> That's very interesting. Hey, uh, everybody knows that you picked sir, a bunch of bold-faced liars, so why should I trust you? It's like, man. Like, he just starts, he keeps on pushing and pushing him. And he's like, if you want to go outside and you want to test me, man, we could do this right now. I don't care if it's with sword, spear, dagger, barehanded, horseback, or walking, unmounted. Dude, let's do this. Cull just keeps on messing with him because he realizes, especially in you know this uh, comic book, he, he realizes that you know he's like, I am not allowed to raise my spear against you. In these halls, I'm not allowed to raise my spear against you. So, I'm saying. And he's like, really? So he actually takes his sword, he goes up to, and he stops. He doesn't actually hit him. But Brule is a very stoic person, and he is not going to dishonor himself. If he's not allowed to fight, then he's going to let Kroll forever remember, you killed me when I wasn't allowed to fight you. You're a punk. But Kroll wasn't, Kroll's not that kind of person. He never had any intent of doing that. He needed to test Brule, and he recognized that he was indeed a tough and stoic individual, and a man of his word, a man of honor. These two would wind up becoming the absolute inseparable best of friends. But it'd be pretty choppy at first, I'm saying. So he decides to go and meet Kanu. And um, just double checking, yes, Kanu. So he goes to meet Kanu. He's got to do it at night because he's got to go alone and whatnot. But he trusts the pick. So he goes there and he's just like, you know, hey, what's going on? And Kanu is basically this, uh, he's this elder chieftain. And he's got, you know, he, he likes his women. He likes his wine. You know, so he likes some of the uh, the basic stuff in life, right? Uh, but he is still wise, and he does know things that the king doesn't know. Now, he never went to the previous king or any of the other kings because he couldn't trust them. But Cull is a barbarian. Cull is one of the savage people. He doesn't have that, you know, that idea of being brought up in nobility and that sterner stock where everything's about to seat. No, everything is done with your hands. You trust your own hands, your own shoulders, your own legs your own back, and your own wits. That's what you trust. You make an alliance with someone, it's for exactly as long as it's supposed to be. There are agreed upon terms. You don't break a contract. And then you go on your separate ways unless you've decided otherwise. Everything is done at face value. There is no debauchery. There is no, you know, closed room deals or backdoor bargains or anything like that. That's just simply not the way that it works in the barbarian world. And... Again, this is a lot of what Robert E. Howard proselytizes in all of his stories. 
So, uh, when he goes and he talks to this Pictish chieftain, uh, Kanu, he's like, hey, you know, uh, what's up? What's going on? And he's just talking to him. He's like, listen, there are things out there that you're not familiar with. Things that, you know, you, you, you couldn't possibly know, but you have to be aware of some of these things. He's like, and I need you to trust me. And he's like, well, you know, trust is one thing, but I mean, like, you're not giving me anything. He starts talking about, you know, men weren't always ruled by men. You know this, right? Now, I did mention the Cthulian mythos, right? So, uh, the idea is that the elder gods used to rule the, the worlds, the universe, you know, and particularly the earth. And then eventually they were banished. Now, you can go back and look at the Marvel Cosmos and the Demiurge and, you know, all that good stuff and how the, you know, they were all, uh, most of them were, were gotten rid of. Gaia is the only one who was actually allowed to stay, allowed to stay. But Set and Shumagorath and, and Cthon and all these elder gods, they weren't allowed to stay. The Dweller of the Darkness is one of them. Uh, they weren't allowed to stay. They were exiled. Some of them were actually killed and their names long since forgotten. And anyway, Atom eventually shed them. And that's when like Mephisto and some of the other Hell Lords and, and the like and Death Lords actually came about uh, in creation. Mephisto is nowhere near what like a Cthon would be, you know, or what a what a Krom would be, you know, something along those lines. So, yeah, there's that. Anyway, um, actually, no, not a Krom. It'd probably be about equal. Anyway, so um, so there were used to be these elder gods and these spawn of these elder gods, and that's what Kanu is talking about. That's what he's warning. Uh, call about and calls just like you know I don't know what this has to do with anything so that's cool just just give me that heads up it's like I need you to trust me so he finishes his drink and you know as opposed to it being in his robe like in the original story anyway he finishes his drink he's like oh what's in here and he's like that's one of the green gems of the uh, temple of set the temple of the the lizard king the the, the serpent priests you know and all that what <laughs> lizard king Jim Morrison's right there. Come on, baby, let you know. So he's just like, you know, these, there were two of them, and, you know, the, its sister was, they were both stolen, and you have one of them. The entire, all of the kingdoms, the, the, the seven empires would come rain holy terror upon you if they knew that you had this. It's like, yeah. And I'm trusting you to not go and spread this information. That is what I'm doing. I'm trusting that you're not going to break this trust. It's like, okay, cool. So Kanu says, so now you have this over me. So you know that I need your trust and that I trust you. Please, when the time comes, please trust me. And in that, trust Brule. Brule will come back to you tonight. When he does, I need you to trust everything that he tells you. Calls like, we'll see. So he goes back home. When he goes back home, he's hanging out, blah, 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 blah whatever. Uh, that's when Brul shows up. He has to, of course, skirt around the guards and climb over the walls of the city and all the, you know, the city of wonders. He goes up and like, hey, what's going on? So he's like, let me show you the secret door. He's like, what? In my own chamber, there's a secret door. I, I can't believe this. In the king's chambers, um, the, the king's room, the throne room. What's going on here? So like, yeah, come on, just follow me. So they start going down, they start looking around. It's like, what are all these dead bodies doing on the ground? He's like, yeah, look at that. There's all these red slayers, some of your personal guard, they're they're dead on the ground. That's interesting, isn't it? He's like, yeah. who killed them? He's like, but are they really dead? Look up there. So he looks and through certain, you know, hidden precipices, he's able to see up on the actual, you know, you know, they're down in like this antechamber under the ground right now. And he looks up and he sees the Red Slayers with the same faces up there just guarding. I don't understand what I'm looking at. Call is saying. He's like, they wait. And two, one of the king's personal advisors comes walking by. He's got his dagger. 
drawn. Is this going to work? This is going to work. This is going on. Let's go follow him. There's another secret passage. We'll get to where he's going before he, uh, he does. Let's go. So they get over there, and it's Cull's actual sleeping quarters. What's going on? He's like, get into bed. Fake the deep, the deep sleep. Watch what happens. Okay? He trusts them. All this going on, he trusts them. So he gets in. And Brule kills him. No, I'm joking. That's not what happens. Actually, two comes up and he pulls his dagger and he goes up to, to do the blow and, and calls, you know, you know, I was in there. He's got his eye like a little bit open looking at him, like like Paul Atreides from Dune. And uh, it's like, uh, call, slay. That's what Brule calls out. He, he does this every so often. Call, slay. It means, you know, kill this guy. <laughs> you know, so he's about to kill you. Kill him. So he gets up and he's like, ah. It doesn't even hit him that hard. And yet, he dies. Two, he dies. Falls down the ground, dead. It's like, why did he come and kill me? Or try and, try and kill me? I don't get it. He's like, did he? He's like, what are you talking about? He's like, look at it again. Is it actually him? The face starts to melt off. And there's this face of a lizard. Yeah, that's right. The original lizard people, you can blame Robert E. Howard for that. The conspiracies of lizard people taking over the world. That was Robert E. Howard in the Cull stories. Hey, Alex Jones started here. <laughs> Maybe. Anyway, so um, so he just sees this like, what in the hell is going on? And he's like, there's a lot of lizard people around taking us over. And I'm saying, you got to be careful, bro. So he's just shocked beyond belief. Like, he can't understand what in the freaking heck is going on. Now, there's uh, this saying, and I know this saying. I don't think I wrote it down here, though. I think I wrote it down someplace else. I'm going to find that saying. Because he says, you know, there's certain things about this. we got to get out of here. But uh, there's, there's a certain phrase that lizard people can't say. In fact, only humans are capable of saying because nobody else has our facial features, you know, and our, our palates, our tongues, and everything. So only humans are capable of saying this phrase. Kanama kalajarama. Kanama kalajarama. That's the phrase. If you can say this, then you're human. So... Cole is like, dude, what the frick? Okay. So they go back to their own separate chambers and whatnot and, you know, do a thing and Cole doesn't sleep, Brule doesn't sleep. They ain't sleeping. Would you? <laughs> Any of these guys could be evil. So he's having meetings with his people. And he's imagining all of their heads actually being <laughs> big lizard heads, you know? He's freaked out at this point. So he gets called to... Go to the uh, <clears throat> to the um, uh, the king's chamber or the king's you know audience hall whatever, and actually address you know listen to the the address of the counselors. It's like all right, and he's nervous. Any one of them, dude. Any one of them. Brule goes with him. So he's up there they're talking and they're just, you know, doing whatever. And they're they're talking and and Brule's like, you gotta be careful because with two gone, like you were supposed to be killed last night in your sleep. So some of them have to know what's going on. He's like, all right, cool. So um oh also I should mention while two was actually walking away, um uh, oh geez, I actually forgot a lot. When two was, uh, excuse me, when, when two was killed and Brule was taking his body away uh, by the order of Cull, all of a sudden Brule comes back and he throws his spear at him and they have to fight and Cull winds up killing him and Brule turns into a uh, lizard head being and then Brule proper comes walking out. He's like, uh, what the frick is this? So he's like, how do I know it's you? He's like, uh, Kanama, <laughs> uh, Ka Najarama? 
<laughs> like, I think that's how it's supposed to be pronounced. Uh-oh, I'm going to be killed if I don't say it right. So anyway, he just, he goes and gives the line, right? Kanama ka la jarama. So he's just like, you know, ah, see, it's it's me. And he's like, okay, fine. He's like, wait, I feel something coming. I don't see it, but I feel it. And I'm cold inside. So they go off to the side, like, let's hide. And coming around the corner is an actual ghost. And it's actually the ghost of uh, Iral. This is uh, the oldest of the ancient kings of Volusia, the, the city of wonders. And he's like, what? And Cole, like, slices at it, and it disappears. Did you see its face? That was Ilal. He's like, yeah. The story was that this guy was actually uh, killed by one of the lizard people. And when you're killed by one of the lizard men, you forever, your ghost forever becomes their slave. So they're both considerably freaked out at this point. And Cole says, Brule... I need you to swear to me that if I am ever almost killed by these things and like you see that my life is about to end, that you will stab me through the chest, through the heart, and you will take my life so that I don't have to be a, a ghost for these guys, a slave for these things for eternity. Brule says, and you promise to do the same for me. That's when they they embrace arms and they are actually, they fully trust each other. And there's a bond there and that would never be broken again. It's a really cool moment. This is like this, the truth, finding the truth and being afraid of all the debauchery around you. Like this is a, a solid friendship moment. And these two genuinely are essentially inseparable from this point on. And they're actually loyal to each other. And it's 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 a really cool moment. Anyway, so he sees this stuff going on when he's up in his, you know, the audience hall. And they start walking towards him and reaching into their, you know, their, their, their clothing, their robes, slowly. And he's like, dude, this is the moment. They're going to attack me. So he says, I have something I have to say to all of you guys. Kanama ka lajarama. And they're all like... And they freak out and they wince. And he's like, ah, you're wincing. You're all lizard people. So, so all of a sudden, Brule's like, slay calls. <laughs> they start tearing these things down and they fall and they die and they turn into lizard head people. And every single one of them are lizard men. He's like, what the frick? Well, where's my actual counsel? Now, when they all die and he's saying this, all of a sudden, an illusion drops. They were using magic. The illusion drops, and he's like, we're still where they originally grabbed me from. We never went anywhere. Wait, so who's up in the in the king's chamber? So they take that secret passageway to get up there. And when they do get up there, they see that Cull is actually up there addressing the, the counselors. Cull is addressing when he's looking at himself addressing, so he realizes right away, these are the real counselors. That's not the real me. So he goes running up there, die! <laughs> they go at it with each other, and Cull winds up killing the snake thing. He turns into a lizard in front, and the council's like, what the frick just happened? So he takes him downstairs, like, look, more dead people. Oh, my God, we're doing that! So he locks that chamber up forever to never be opened again, and yeah. That's pretty much how that ends. <laughs> it's some freaky stuff from this point on. Uh, so make sure, you know, you see your neighbors and whatnot. Make sure that to each other, you kainama uh, ka lajaraba. I'm saying it might save your life. Daggers in the dark. So, um, uh, this is basically, this is the first two issues of Call. Now, normally I'd be going into the third issue of Call the Conqueror, except I'm not going to. Why? Because the third issue actually has Thulsa Doom in it. But that's not the first appearance of Thulsa Doom. No, the first appearance of Thulsa Doom is actually in Monsters on the Prowl, issue number 16. Yeah, I know. Weird, right? Anyway, this is a story of Cole where they deal with the, the serpent god of the Lost Swamp. This is one of the last times that we're actually going to deal with the lizard people uh, and their giant freaking monster. 
excuse me, while they're out there, they wind up losing three of the um, the Red Slayers. I think there were six of them. Electo was one of them, and uh, they lose three of them while they're out there. Um, you know, like through different points, so you notice how you know tough that the, these fights are. Anyway, they see this one guy regular guy praying and you know calls like i don't trust you and he's like wait no Kala, you know ka nama ka lajarama and he's like oh okay i guess you're okay then hey <laughs> so they're hanging out and just like you know what's going on he's like well i came here to you know bury my or you know help my 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 girlfriend my beloved and then they killed her and all this crazy stuff and it's like i, I hate them i hate them so much these lizard people it's like oh that's a really sad story but he says, you know, yeah, my name is uh, Thulsa Doom. It's like, okay, cool. So they go back and they're hanging out. Now, Brule has actually heard of Thulsa Doom, but he's not from this city from the north, as he goes and points out. He's from the swamps of the south, and he's a dangerous guy. <laughs> Change the subject. <laughs> so they do. Later on, however, there's all sorts of crazy things happening, and there's a bunch of illusions happening in Thulsa Doom. This is in uh, actual issue number three of Call the Conqueror. Uh, Thulsa Doom actually reveals who he is, and he's like, you know, you, uh, I see that you took Kanu as your one of your counselors, your advisors right now. Cool. And he also gave you that green gem. Guess what I've got? He's got the sister of it. He's like, and I need that one. It's like, I'm not giving it to you. He's like, dude, what are you going to do with it? Just give me the freaking thing. He's like, uh, no. So a whole bunch of crazy things happen. Like there's plenty of illusions showing up. And he and Cole is at this point freaked out. And he goes to, uh, to Kanu. He's just like, listen, man, I'm giving this thing back to you. I ain't the man to hold it. He's like, are you sure? He's like, yes. Please take it back. So he takes it back. <gasps> Turns out it's actually an illusion. It's false of doom. He's like, what? So Thulsa Doom now has both of these, and Cole's not able to hurt him, even with his sword, uh, or his axe, whatever, and, he's, and Thulsa Doom puts the gems together. It starts doing this incredible freaking, you know, thing, and Thulsa Doom actually can't stand the amount of energy that it's putting out. And they separate, and there's a big hole in the ground. Cole is able to grab one of them, the other falls down there with Thulsa Doom into this bottomless pit. They can't hear a drop. And Cole goes around thinking, like, what should I do? You know, with this other gem, like, what should I do in general? And he's just like, I don't trust magic. So he goes back over and he throws the other one down there also. Again, doesn't hear a thud. What's Thulsa Doom going to do if he finds them both? Try and put them together again? <laughs> Good luck with that. So yeah, done. And they actually build this uh, monument of a giant fist with a broken shackle, you know, in the chain on there because one of the things that Thulsa Doom did was he's like you're a man of very strong spirit I'm not going to kill you I'm going to make you wish for death I'm going to make you a slave and all that stuff he's like give me a sword so I can just end it myself and he's like no you'll never hold a sword again I need to make sure everybody recognizes that you can't uh, beat me and if you can't beat me nobody can beat me he's like I don't need to be wasting my time fending off little threats of people coming up and messing with me all the time instead what I need to do is I need for them to f genuinely fear me and if they see that you're powerless against me the word will spread and there will be less challenges so hey uh, and yes for the sake of conversation I want to verbalize that this is in fact how Thulsa Doom normally looks the, the skull and all that stuff that's 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 him okay and yeah for those of you who, who watched the Conan movie that's not the Thulsa Doom's the riddle of steel stuff the Riddle of Steel is actually stuff that comes from the Cole stories, not from the Conan stories. So, and it's not the Riddle of Steel, it's, it's the Riddle of Knowledge, I think it is. It's a different riddle. But anyway, um, yeah, so <laughs> it was Conan, but it was mostly a Cole story more than anything else. Either way, it was an amazing, I loved Conan, the, the Barbarian movie. It was amazing. Conan the Destroyer. It had some cool action in it. Aside from that, no, 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 no. I'm a Conan the Barbarian fan. Okay. So, um, and no, I didn't like the other movie, too. I couldn't even get through it. I didn't watch the whole thing. I watched, like, maybe the first half hour. I was like, this is unwatchable. <laughs> so, um, now we're going to move on to issue number four. Um, <clears throat> at this point, there is a heat wave. And, by the way, with issue number four, this is the first one that Jerry Conway is actually... Uh, writing. 
Wait, that's actually issue five that I'm looking at. Issue number four, here we go, The Night of the Red Slayers. Jerry Conway is doing the script for this. However, this is a one-shot where John Jakes jumps on this book. Mind you, uh, Marie and John Severin are the artists for this, uh, for all of these, and they're absolutely amazing. Artie Smek is doing most of the lettering. You can actually go and check out a 15-minute video, 15, 20-minute video I did uh, profiling Artie Smek. It's good stuff. It's worth it. Roy Thomas did the previous issues, and mind you, those previous issues were really, when you when you sit down and think about it, they were really just issues where they were retellings of the Robert E. Howard stories. So Roy Thomas, amazing, uh, very good storyteller. He wasn't telling brand new cult stories. When Jerry Conway came along, he's telling uh, mostly new, you know, some inspiration, of course, but he's really telling new stories. Uh, call the Conqueror stories, call the King stories. So just, you know, rest on that for a bit. Also, for the sake of conversation, it is generally worth noting that um, uh, Wally Wood is actually the inker for this first issue. This is not Wally Wood's best inks, but it is Wally Wood and it's pretty darn good stuff. Um, not sure who Wally Wood is? Look up Wally Wood comics. You'll learn. So, um,. Yeah, John Jakes actually does a little work on this also. Jakes has actually done a whole lot of stories with um, uh, Cole and, and, and all that stuff. So him coming in and doing the story was actually kind of like a godsend. Uh, it was an amazing story. I love this. This is the Night of the Red Slayers. So the Red Slayers, again, the personal bodyguards of Call the Conqueror. Basically, there's a heat wave. There's lots of unrest. And this dude named uh, Melkor comes in. He's just some scholar librarian guy. And he's got this hot daughter who likes to dance. And she wants to dance for Call. That's all she wants. She just wants to dance for Call. And, you know, if he happens to be looking for a wife, he's like, yeah, I'm not looking for a wife. All right? Your dad's here, so I'm not talking about just doing the boom shakalaka with you. I'm saying I'm not really looking for a wife. Although... Pretty fly, Mama. How you doing? What's up, girl? So anyway, um, she wants to dance for him, but it's too hot. He's suffering from headaches because it's so freaking hot. Like, Cole can't stand the heat right now. It's just, it's too much, you know? And um, she says, you know, I, you know what I really need is to go on the ships. And Melkor is like, yeah, we were supposed to go on a ship, but, you know, we couldn't because can't afford it because stuff. So Cole's like, you know, as a king, I happen to have ship i'm saying so he's like oh hey that's cool you want to take me on your ship he's like come on mama let's go so they go on a ship there's a bunch of people go on a ship brule doesn't quite get on the ship fast enough <laughs> he eventually gets on the ship anyway um what do you call it? electo goes with uh goes to try and find um electo goes and tries to find call once he gets back from the ship because like things get really bad Turns out that Electo and a bunch of other people are going around killing a bunch of Cull's enemies. See, all of this started because the um, the bard Redondo is, again, starting some trouble. He's on top of the rafters in this pub, and he's like, yeah, the, you, you really suck, whatever. And and the Red Guard are like, you know, the Red Slayer's like, we're not putting up with this. This is treason, and Cull is awesome. So they start pounding the crap out of people, and they're getting to fight, whatever. It's a fight, all right? It's a regular fist fight everybody's going to wind up getting hurt. Anyhow, so um, at one point, Cull walks in and sees this fight, and he's like, this needs to stop. I don't know what this is about, but this needs to stop. And it's like, well, but he's up there singing, you know, treacherous songs. Redondo's like, I'm just voicing the will of the people, my peeps. That's all I'm doing, my king. And the king's like, oh, you know, he's the minstrel. If he's not going to be honest, what do we got? He's giving us a, and this is very important. This is one of the things I love about Call. He's willing to let there be some dissent. Because if he doesn't hear it coming, one, they're going to find another way to do it. Two, if he doesn't hear it coming, he doesn't know what's happening anymore. What, you think you quashed it just because you don't hear it anymore? Uh -uh. It's better just to let it go and listen to it and, and listen to the complaints and try and fix what's wrong. Gee, imagine that. Uh, unless they're just being a bunch of trolls, in which case you block them all. Because, you know, Valencia is like, uh, Volusia is like, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Twitter, right? Anyway, so <laughs> um, all these people start going around uh, after Call leaves and goes on the ship and, and starts going after these dissenters. It's like, dude, this is messed up, man. What's going on, bruh? Turns out it's not really the Red Guard. 
the real Red Guard, or the Red Slayers, like, um, hi, and that's a really unfortunate name in this case, the Red Slayers. So it turns out that uh, Melkor was actually cheating, and he was making wax duplicates of these guys, and um, uh, they weren't able to talk, they weren't particularly sophisticated, but they were able to move and kill regular people. So they're going around killing all Kull's enemies. Why? He's friends with Kull? No! Because it's going to look more like Kull's the bad guy. So all these guys are going to start doubling their efforts to go after him. And they're also going to say, we need to put the Red Slayers, including Electo, in prison. This way, Kull's not going to have his personal bodyguards anymore. Like, the thought that was put into this is amazing to me, all right? Cole winds up figuring out what's going on, and he also realizes that uh, this hot chick who dances a lot is also one of the wax figurines. But there was a lot of work putting in, put into her. She actually had vocal cords developed and the like. Um, didn't Melikor didn't bother doing it to anybody else. So anyways, he gets put away, and yeah, that's how that pretty much ends. Actually, it ends with uh, him going outside, and it's like the stifling heat, and it starts to drizzle, starts to rain outside. And he's Cole's got a smile. One of the few times he'll actually smile. I really like the way this one ended. Mind you, the entire time I'm reading all these issues, I'm just thinking to myself, man, I wish they would just go back to the lizard people thing because that was really cool. But then every issue would be like, wow, this is actually just as cool. Maybe next issue they go back to the lizard people. Wow, this is really cool. Maybe next issue. Seriously, that's the way that it kept on working with me. I kept being reminded of the lizard people, but every one of these stories was amazing. Anyway, so we're going to move on to issue number five at this point. Hanar of uh, Damascar is uh, is hunting for, uh, uh, um, what do you call it, some food. And Cole happens to be out by himself hunting the same thing. And he just thinks that he's a peasant hunter. You know, uh, uh, Hanar thinks that he's just a peasant hunter. Now, Damascar is all the way from the south and surrounds like, you know, wow, hey, check this out. I'm also going to mention something that you're going to understand at the end of this issue's explanation, issue number five's explanation. You're not going to understand it now, though. Why I would say it. Hunar is black, and the people of Damascar are black also. Let's move on. Um, actually, and the enemy state that he's talking about, led by Zakar, is uh, this state is called Rinkos, and they're also black. I'm just going to put this out there. I'll explain later on why I even mentioned this. So, Hunar uh, thinks that, he, that Kull is just a, a servant until he actually sees him uh, two days later, because the next day he goes and he sends a bunch of money to uh, these guys. Money, and more specifically, these really well-crafted tools and weapons. And everybody's like, wow, look at this. Even uh, Kanu, the picked leader, is like, you know, hey, kind of like this uh this hunar guy and call has to mention you know you've always been a greedy one haven't you picked and he's like but i get what you're saying so here's the deal bang 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 so he decides to meet with hunar and hunar's like oh i thought you were a slave looks like i was wrong i thought you were just you know a hunter turns out i was wrong so anyways my king this is what i need to do could you come down and help me out because this uh enemy place rinkos they, um, they keep on attacking us and hurting us, and we would really like your Black Legion to come and help you, your famed Black Legion, to come and help us out. He's like, all right, I'm bashful. You said nice things. Plus, I think that you're cool people and, you know, the weapons. Are... Okay, I met you in person. You seem like good people, so let's go down, and I'm going to help you out. He doesn't even think about the weapons, right? Goes down to help him out. Once they... It's funny. As they're actually uh, going down there, uh, the high priest of the um the damascarians comes up to honar and says uh my master should there be a should i release a charm to get us to where you know to fill the sails with uh with wind he's like yeah we don't want to take any chances let's just get down there as soon as we can he's like, all right cool so he's got a ring with a little boop, poker on it and just boop, one of the sailors it's one of um it's one of um calls people so this guy, he's like, oh, okay, oh, whatever. And he's like, ow. He just goes on, does his thing, starts climbing up the mast, I guess up to the crow's nest, and all of a sudden, uh, his muscles go rigid, he falls off, he dies. Call's like, well, this is a bad omen. <laughs> like, we're not even there yet. Somebody already drops dead. Dude, was his cholesterol high? What's going on? So anyway, goes down with all the trans, fat, trans fats. He gets down to um, Damascar, 
and no sooner do they get there than all of a sudden they get attacked by big devil wings. These big pterodactyl looking things, right? They, they look like freaking plesiosaurs flying in, <laughs> razor big teeth and, and all that stuff. Uh, they start attacking. Looks like Sauron. Uh, Saur yeah, Sauron from, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the Savage Land. I think his name is Sauron. Anyway, so these things show up, and this is a really awesome battle. They are literally stabbing and jumping and stabbing to the next highest one and jumping and stabbing the next highest one, and they're flying through the sky, stabbing, you know, these things. They're not flying. They're jumping to each, you know, each one and trying to take all these things down. Call gets back. He's like, bro, can I borrow your sword? Thank you. You mother fathead, Hunar. You didn't tell me there were going to be devils and monsters out here. What's going on? You lied to me? He's like, kind of. You know, I just want to make sure you're going to come down. But you're a brave Black Legion. But yeah, I really need your help. And I'm not going to apologize for this, okay? We genuinely need your help. Please consider continuing to help us, even though these are going to seem like insurmountable odds because they are a bunch of devils on this island. He's like, fine. But we're going to be doing it for revenge, not for anything else. He's like, okay, so you're in the same boat as us. Cool. Anyway. Um, Call tells Brule, I don't trust this cat. So can you please go and hawk this guy down, do a little bit of spying? Be a, be a pal. Like, yeah, sure, no problem. Goes up there, but winds up getting caught because they've got a, a bird that can actually see hidden people. Um, they also, he also realized that there's a bunch of magic going on. Now, through him being captured, he's about to be sacrificed in order to give enough power to these guys. They need these demon people destroyed. And mind you, these actually are demon people in this other city. They're demonic sons of guns, all right? They practice the darkest kinds of magic, and they're demons at this point. Guess what? Very similar situation, you know, as Rinkos, also in Damascar. So these guys have been seriously practicing a lot of magic, all of them for the most part, practicing magic heavily, leaning on it, in order to repel these forces and to try and conquer them. They're basically ancient enemies. Uh, they get on the ships, they start going over there. Um, obviously, he doesn't take Brule with him because they couldn't find him. He's like, whatever, I have to trust that he's going to be able to take care of himself. He does. He winds up killing the high priest through really cool methodical means. Uh, Cole, for the most part, is like, aren't your men going to help us attack? Like, look, they're, they're, they're dead people that they, you know, they're, they're, they're the undead. They're not going to die again. It's like, yeah, true, but go kill them with your Black Legion. Hmm. It's like, your men aren't even going to help? He's like, why should I waste my precious men? Our lives are precious. They're sacred. You're not. That's why we hired you on. It's like, mother, what did you just say? He's like, in fact, maybe your time is at an end also. Ah, goes after him with a sword. Man, backstabbing mother fathead. Anyway, so he goes and he beats the crap out of this guy. And then when Brule is able to get rid of the high priest, suddenly the spells are destroyed. All these other spells, it turns out that a lot of these other ships didn't actually mean anything. Was there even a Rinkos at all, for crying out loud? Hmm. So anyway, through it all, and the you know once this illusion drops, uh, Cull is getting ready to leave. But this princess, uh, Krista, she actually came in during the night, the, the previous night, and was like, please help us. Here's a crystal ball. Look at these demons over there in Rinkos. It's like, yeah, get out of here, woman. I don't know if I believe you. But anyway, get out of here. So she says, listen, you don't have any reason to trust us. We're all tainted by this dark shamanistic magic. But we would like you to take our children who were not, this is a generation that was not touched by this magic and raise them in Volusia so that, you know, in the City of Wonders so that they actually have a chance at life. It's too late for us. We understand that. But please take our kids. He's like, should I? And Baron Kanub is like, no. He's like, thanks for making this easy. Yeah, we'll take them. And they leave. And then Damascar sinks into the sea. And it's really cool because um, he notices, he looks at this, he's like, is this like a portent for the future? The Great Cataclysm, thinking of Atlantis. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so there's a whole bunch, like, you know, thinking about the future and all sorts of stuff like that with this story. Now, Here's the reason why I mentioned that they're black. Native Americans and Native Canadians, uh, the indigenous peoples here in Canada, and I'm part Cherokee, you know, coming from the United States. 
the um, the children of Native Americans were actually taken by settlers, uh, colonizers, if you will, and they were put in schools. There was actually this uh, big saying back in the day: "Kill the Indian, save the Christian child." As long as they changed their customs and their culture and their religion and dressed the way that they, they thought that a good Indian should then they were brought and taught English and taught Western culture and, and then left on their own, you know, from that point on. But they basically assimilated them into uh, white American culture or white Canadian culture. That's what happened. In fact, the, um, the residential schools that this happened to the, to the indigenous peoples here in Canada, the last one closed down in 1992. Think about that. It's not that long ago. So, with that being the case, they um, they say, "Hey, take our children because it was, is at least some hope for us." Now, I'm not saying that Jerry Conway is a racist. I'm not saying that at all. What I am, however, saying is, with colonization in Africa, with what happened with the Native Americans, with just, you know, what we've done with the Chinese peoples, what we've done with the Irish, what we've done with, you know, the Italians and with the Jews, the most recent three that I just mentioned were not considered white at the time. Uh, only later were we, I'm mostly Italian, considered white only only later in, in history. Um, I'm third generation Italian. The first generation was not, or first generation, I'm third generation Italian American, you know, American therefore. So um, my grandfather was not considered white. Just by law, he was not considered white. All that being what it is, it's just the history of, you know, the world that we live in. And everybody's got their own history and everybody's got their own crimes. It bothers me to see this colonizing mindset with black people we're beyond saving because of our culture but please take our children because they can still learn to be civilized wow that's fussed i'm saying it's one of those things where it's like granddad says some racist things he's Still likes different people, but, you know, he still says, you know, those racist jokes all the time. <laughs> oh, Grandpa. Yeah, that's the kind of moment I'm having when I read this story, when I reread this story. Okay, let's move on to issue number five. Excuse me, issue number six. Let's get into issue number six. This is the final one. Here's where we start getting a little Lovecraftian. Basically, this uh, dude, this mercenary called Zarkus, comes to meet up with Krull. It's like... Hey, I was hired by the scholar guy to come along and, you know, help to acquire these these scrolls for him. And, you know, and I'm in the town. I figured I'd say, hi, what's going on? He helped uh, Kroll to defeat this big bear that he and Brule weren't able to beat. Nobody else was going to jump down in this pit and help them out. So um, Zarkus did. And Kroll really appreciated that. He appreciates bravery, you know, the willingness to do something selfless um and brave so um he's you know he's like come back to court and hang out with me and he's thinking you know i'm going to give this guy a job as you know one of the black legion he's like uh, you know i used to be a mercenary like you you learn a whole bunch of really cool things like climbing over walls and getting away from guards but i found the pay to be very unreliable unsteady so he's basically offering him a job right Zarkus says, Zarkus says, yes, you know, I'll take the job and all that good stuff. Here's a deal, uh, you know, uh, you know, I was here because of the scrolls and all that stuff for this one librarian. Hey, look, here's a scholar now. So this guy, Malachar, shows up. It's like, you know, he's just got an evil name. He's got an evil looking face and all that stuff. He's just like, hey, I'm here because I studied some stuff and it turns out there's this big city that's hiding underneath, you know, somewhere underneath the, this, this very city here. It's a totally cool city, man. I'm saying we should go down there. They probably got treasures and riches and all sorts of cool stuff. 
And two, this old uh, advisor is like, no. Last time somebody came with this half-baked cockamamie plan, all of a sudden, the waters, uh, they were poisoned and people were dying in the streets. It's like, don't listen to this guy, King. King calls like, yeah. Here's the rest of his story. He's like, not interested. But have a good day. Bye. He's like, mm -hmm. and he leaves. The next day, all the wells, all the water sources are poisoned. And people start dying. Just a little sip, and they die. That's kind of fussed, bruh. Malachar, in the meantime, had gone up and did a nighttime visit. Uh, excuse me, Zarkis did a nighttime visit to Malachar. He's like, hey, I get you the scrolls, but that bag seemed a little light. You're actually going to be staying around here and all this stuff. I'm going to need you to pony up a little bit more gold. Let's just take the whole purse, man. I hate you. He's like, ah, that's a lot of money. Thank you. I'm going back to my palace um, uh, room right now. Toodles. So he leaves. Um, so with all this, cre you know, all these people dying, Call is out there and he's like, what's going on? And all of a sudden this thing comes up from the ground. Now we don't get to see the whole thing. We just see what turns out is just the back of this thing. But it's actually digging through the bottom of the earth and, and blowing up cobblestones and stuff like that. It's hurting people. And they're like, you know, kill it. It's not dying. It's this thing from beneath the earth. Well, uh, it turns out that it's actually Malachar. He's got this, he's got these other scrolls that he didn't want Call to know about. And he's got this flute recorder type thing that, you know, like this, this, he's a Pied Piper now that can make this thing come up from the earth. So Call decides to arrest Malachar because he's like, this is too coincidental. He's like, you're a jerk. He's like, yeah, whatever. Finally decides to relieve him of the arrest and says, you're going to come with us. We're going to go down and try and find this city because there's something up and we got to figure out what's going on. He's like, okay, you're cool again. So Malachar and these guys all go downstairs. Malachar winds up killing two people who get too close to him. All right. By tricking one of them, tricking and tricking poison and then poisoning the other one. And just, yeah, it's, 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 it, it gets messy. All right. He's actually killing folk. Um, while they're down there, this uh, beast, the thing below the earth, it pops up as this gigantic, totally awesome looking uh, terror, right? It's this big terror that's supposed to, you know, Cthulian type. And it only responds to Malachar's whistle, uh, his, his, his big flute thing. Anyway, uh, these guys can't kill it. It's way too powerful. And then eventually they find out, hey, this thing, and they kill him. They, they, they take care of Malachar. And then um, without his ability to play the flute, this thing just goes completely dormant. So they run up, they start stabbing him, they start dousing him with um, with oil and, and, and gas, and then they want to setting him on fire, and he's like, ow, but I can't move because I'm, I don't have the whistle blown against me. Yeah, that thing. So he, it winds up dying. Now, Zarkus didn't help with that. He helped with the battle, and he kicked some serious butt, but afterwards it was just the cleanup action and Zarkus wasn't interested in jumping in to help them carry this oil over there to try and stop this you know try and burn this this uh frozen monster so he goes over and he hangs out he starts picking flowers and smelling them he's laying down he's just relaxing because he's a greedy son of a gun he's only interested in action and the you know because he was saying at one point he's like you know i bet there's a lot of riches down there hey maybe we can loot the place and calls just like you're really greedy, aren't you? He calls him out. Okay. So, with this big Cthulian type monster dead, we go over and we see that Zarkus has died also, and and he doesn't know how he died. Nobody understands how he died, but they decide we got to ship out of here. Uh, and then in the scrolls, we come to find out nobody actually finds out. Only the audience finds out. The readers that this whole city died because they had poisonous fra uh, poisonous fragrant flowers so the fragrance itself came up and went up killing all these people that's how um Zarkus died there's a bunch more stories like there's uh, another hundred plus stories of call all right just in the comic books alone and they're worth it they're so worth it my peeps you get great stories just like this Here's a trick of it. <clears throat> um, all of these stories, based on the Robert E. Howard world, all right, and his philosophy on things, 
I want you to think about every single time that magic was brought up. Any time that this, the, the theory of magic was broached in any way, shape, or form, what was the spell? It was always illusions. Magic is associated with deceptive nature, uh, deceptive actions, all right, tricking, pulling the wool over our eyes, illusions, debauchery, all this good stuff, bad, bad stuff. Uh, Robert E. Howard made Cull very suspicious and wary of people who used magic. Every single time it came up, it turned out it was all just an illusion. Everything, it was just an illusion. And that's the biggest deal about magic in the Hyborian or Thelusian, you know, pre-cataclysmic days. That is interesting. It's very genuinely interesting. Uh, Robert E. Howard was a mass kind of guy. He grew up, he grew up, he lived in the wild, literally, legit lived in the wild west, in the wild west. And he thought that, you know, anybody can make a living as long as you have two strong hands and a good back. And if you're honest, just keep your head down and do your job. You can make an honest living. The trick is there are a lot of people who are very deceptive, and he hated that idea. He associated them with being cowards. He associated them with, a, you know, trying to take the easy way out and things like that. Mind you, this was a very different time period where the, the idea that you could put in a hard day's work and get a very fair day's pay, well, that's no more for the most part. Most jobs like that don't exist nowadays. There's there's no rumor of those jobs ever existing, you know, in the past, since the Great Depression. Um, but this is Robert E. Howard's take on things, and it's a very interesting take. There are these monsters that don't really care about us, and if they did, hey, we're not in their plans. Their plans are to get rid of us so they can go about doing their own thing again, maybe to enslave us again that everything is about illusion and deceptiveness, and these are the people who will never succeed. But the people who actually use their own two hands, the people who actually work and stay honest and stay true to themselves, and they don't sell out, these are the people who will actually be successful. These are the people who will eventually be able to see through all these illusions to actually genuinely make a better life for themselves instead of spending all their time furtively trying to attain wealth through trickery. It's Yeah, he wouldn't have been a fan of Loki either. I'm just saying. These are amazing books, my peeps. And the philosophy, the theory behind them are amazing. When you get into them, you understand who the Robert E. Howard character, you know, person actually is, his personage. Yes, definitely. Definitely consider grabbing these books. I don't know if you can get them in trade, but you can definitely get them digital. You can definitely get them physical. They're not even going to be that expensive because, for the most part, nobody's dying for these books. However, if a new uh, Cull movie comes out that does not star Ste uh, Kevin Sorbo, how much you want to bet the prices will jack up? A lot. So consider getting these now. These are great stories. I think you're going to love them. And as for me, I am out. Professor Bill, Comic Book University. Class dismissed.